uh, Marx and Engels as they enunciated their version of socialism. It's the version of socialism that really dominated uh, left thinking. There are other ones kicking around, but they really got marginalized for about a century, from 1850 up until about 1950 or so. Uh, and the label was scientific socialism. So in one respect, they did see themselves as a child of the Enlightenment. Right, The, the world works according to certain natural laws that we can understand and having uh, reached an understanding, a social scientific understanding of the way the world works, we can make predictions right, about how the phenomena are going to uh, behave right, in, the, in the future. So that, that, that part is exactly right. Uh, and then uh, the second part of what you were saying is that yes, uh, part of the problem by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century is that all of the major predictions of the classical Marxist model uh, were not only just not coming true, but the exact opposite right, of them seemed to be coming true. So for example, Marx's slogan, uh, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We've all heard that slogan. Uh, uh, but what that predicts then is in this brutal, competitive, capitalist uh, struggle for resources that the Marxists describe uh, the free market in terms of, you're going to have kind of successive rounds of competition. And what will happen then is some people will win and some people will lose. And the losers then will be forced into poverty. And then the winners will uh, enjoy the spoils. But then, of course, the winners start to fight amongst each other. Uh, and then some of those then get forced into poverty. And then what you end up with is a very few capitalists at the top who are in control of all of society's resources. And the vast majority of people are forced into subsistence level right, poverty. So that is the theory with a definite set of predictions. But then it becomes very clear as you get into the 20th century that uh, it's not the case that we're having a smaller number of rich people right at the top of the heap. Instead, what happens is we have more and more rich people right, developing in the free market capitalists. It's not the case that most people are being forced into poverty. Instead, what happens is the poverty rate is going down, and uh, people are being lifted out of poverty. They had also predicted that the middle class was this temporary class, that it was going to be squeezed out right, by, the, uh, by the free market competition. The petty bourgeoisie will That's disappear. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would become even more petite. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but what then, of course, was happening was the exact opposite of that. The middle class right, was expanding. So as the social science data right, came in, and it got better as the 20th century went on, then clearly the Marxists are looking at the data. They're looking at the theory. We are social scientists, and they're recognizing that there's a major mismatch between the theory and the practice. Uh, and so that is, I think, one of the things that by, we get by the time rather we get to uh, the 1950s, people are rethinking after World War II what, what's going to happen next. The left is rethinking. We, we have to do something to the classical Marxist framework because it's just not working. So what do we do? Postmodernism is one of the variations that <coughs> so comes So how come that. then the skeptical epistemological tradition mm. uh, or the anti-enlightenment epistemological right. tradition becomes so attractive yes. I, I for a movement that is trying to cope with its uh, disappointment and, and failed predictions. Yeah, that's one of the, the more controversial, this is one of the things I get more heat from right in my, in my books, right? Because then the analogy that I make sometimes for ex explanatory at this point is to say, if you think of socialism, it's not just a scientific theory trying to understand the world that it also is uh, an eschatological theory. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a theory of high idealism that if we commit ourselves to, we are going to transform the world and, and create, so to speak, heaven on earth. And so all of that religious language, I think, is important to understanding the psychology right, of people who buy into the Marxist tradition. And there always then is a question, if you have a strongly held idealistic faith in something, it's part of the fiber of who you are. What do you do when the data and the arguments and the evidence seems to be against it? Right. So if you think of people who are very religious, but they're also intellectual and they think seriously about the arguments for and against the existence of God, and the rational side of their mind saying, I don't think uh, I can defend my faith intellectually anymore. What do you do right, at that very pregnant moment right, inside your head? And you have a couple of strategies. One thing is to do is to say, well, 
if the reason and the evidence and the logic are going against my faith, then I need to change my faith. Right? I need to get a different religion, become non-religious, right, or something like that. Because it's important to get the truth, and the way we get the truth is by looking at the data and the evidence. But we also know that the other strategy people can follow psychologically is if the evidence and the data goes against something that they really want to believe deeply, they will go on the offensive against reason, they will go on the offensive against logic, they will say everything is just semantics, nobody really knows the truth, right? That's just your interpretation, right? That is to say they bring in skeptical epistemological strategies or relativistic cognitive strategies, but it's a defense mechanism for a value system or a belief system that they want to hold dearly. And I do think that there's a lot of truth to that. There are true so believers cannot, on the far <coughs> left. So you, when, when your constructions fail, you start to be a deconstructivist. That's right, that's right. And so, and so instead of saying that we are cr uh, creating a new earth and new heavens, actually uh, there is a Swedish author, Fredrik Ström, who wrote a five-series uh, five, uh, book of called Rebellen, the Re Re Rebels of the Social Democratic mm. Movement's growth in Sweden. The final book is Nya Himmar och en ny jord, New Heavens and a New Earth, uh. which is the social democratic Sweden created in the 20s, yeah. according to him. So when you cannot create anymore, then you have to be destruct. Uh, or right. deconstruct, at That's least. That's right. That's right. You, then you become deconstructionist. But, uh, but then you deconstruct, and then you also, I guess, you could become a bit of a relativist, in a sense that, that all cultures are equal. There is no, there right. all truth is relative. Yes. And then yeah. you start to uh, try to marry yourself into quantum mechanics uh, or relative theory. Or but not necessarily yeah. by understanding it. But right. Just as a rhetorical tool. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Uh, to come back, yeah, to the issue of science, right, we've all heard, you know, Einstein relativity theory, right? Well, you just glom on to relativity, and then from the uninformed uh, humanities educated, right, perspective, right, that sounds like relativism. Of course it isn't, right? Or Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Oh, incompleteness, so oh, that sounds like us too, right? Or chaos mathematics, right, and so forth. So it then just becomes a semantics issue but it's really uh, just a rhetorical strategy, uh, I think, as you're suggesting, by people who d don't really know the science right, mm. very well. But uh, there is a, a darker streak here. Um, uh, I mean, the, the flip side of uh, if your theory is not going the way you want it to go, how do you handle that? Uh, the flip side of that is that uh, Marxism and socialism, right, more broadly, part of its fervor, right, comes from being critical of free market capitalism, the sins of, uh, of, of free markets as they, uh, as they see them. And uh, part of Marxism, of course, was making predictions, right, that capitalism was going to get worse and worse and then ultimately fail and implode, and out of that, right, would come the revolution. Uh, and there's then an issue of it's not only that by the time we get to the 1950s, the socialist intellectuals can see that there are serious troubles with their theory, but they also can look at the relatively free market capitalist nations around the world, the United States, Canada, most of the Western European nations as well, and they can see that the countries that have gone more free market are all flourishing right, and doing really well. And again, psychologically, how does that fit? Right? When you have spent a significant amount of your intellectual career invested in being bitterly and violently opposed right, to that movement. I would put it this way, if you just put it on a personal level, suppose you think of the person you hated the most in high school, <laughs> right? Or in middle school, right? Who was kind of, you just didn't like this person, you didn't like you, right? And then you go to your high school reunion 20 years later, right? And right, you're working your dead-end job, right, that you hate, and you're just going through your second divorce, right? <laughs> and then <laughs> your hated rival, right, shows up, right, in a beautiful car with a beautiful spouse and clearly is, you know, a multimillionaire and flourishing, right? Uh, so it's not just that you are despairing about where your life is right right now. It's just, ugh, I hate that guy, right? <laughs> and that also, of course, is the, the way it was in the 1950s and the 1960s, because after World War II, uh, the liberal capitalist countries, they picked themselves up, 
they started producing TVs, everybody had a car, they're taking vacations, life was pretty good, right? And that's a problem for the far left. So 